Hey, it's Karen Calla. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Biddies. This is the Drink As You Learn School with two longtime friends. And sometimes we're just two boozy biddies. We wanted to do something for Black History Month and decided to look into the history of black mixologists. Yes, and we learned about a ton of bartenders and this really cool DC-based club called the Mixologist Club, amongst other things. So grab a glass and learn with us. So this is, I think, a really fun and interesting topic for us to talk on because there's going to be a lot of good and bad that comes out of the information that we put forward today in this episode. But it's really, really cool to see what influence there has been from Black mixologists, saloon owners, etc. throughout history and how they've definitely made a major mark in modern day drinking culture. And I feel like maybe it's just been a little bit more neglected than we'd like to say, just because it's hard to say the hard things out loud. Yeah. And that was sort of interesting. We were looking into, you know, what could we do in honor of Black History Month and started to research Black mixologists. One of the articles we came up with was from Vine Pear and a writer called Emily Bell. And I like, she really pointed out that uh, when you think of like mixology today or mixologist, like your craft bartender, it probably depends on where you are. But for a lot of people, you think of this like white bearded guy in a flannel shirt, <laughs> like, Especially if you live in Denver. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, but throughout history, there were these influential black bartenders, even though they may not like some of us know like Jerry Thomas's name. When we talked about some bartenders, like he's considered sometimes the father of mixology, but there's been a lot of influence by black bartenders that isn't quite as well known. And so I guess we're doing our small part to, to help discuss that history. And it's way more interesting, I think, to me and hopefully our listeners than, you know, discussing the soil structure of the Loire of valley in France and how whatever achieves terroir there. Not saying terroir is a bad thing, but it's just kind of a little bit different for us. And we're excited to talk about it. I mean, the history of black bartenders has been pretty much around since the earliest days of European colonization in America. And that's where it becomes the touchy subject of it's obviously the idea of slavery here. I mean, it's been a a position that was forced on to people to cater to someone else. And but what was interesting is even after the revolution and people starting to become more free, the saloon keeping or bartending position was actually one of the few occupations that was open to free black people in America. Right. And the interesting thing, too, is a lot of the so we'll talk about some people who, you know, really struggled and they weren't able to be as successful as they might have been um, bartending. But others born into slavery, they were either freed because of emancipation or they're actually able to buy their freedom because they were so successful as bartenders. Mm -hmm. It's definitely going to be interesting dichotomy between struggle and success in this episode, but it all leads to some form of progress. And it was interesting to me. I know Kara was talking about Emily Bell and her article on Vine Pear. I did a lot of research with a David Wondrich article. He's the cocktail columnist for Esquire magazine and does seem to have a deep passion for uncovering some of these harder times of the industry and also, you know, showing where the success stories were, too. So we are kind of working on two different main articles to go with this episode. And we're going to kind of talk back and forth about the goods and the bads. Yeah. But the other interesting thing to me out of all of this is that mixology is sort of treated or just like tending bar, it's treated as like, it's an elevated skill. Like it's Mm -hmm. a skill set. Like not everyone can go and craft cocktails that everyone wants to enjoy. And so that's where some of these, these are, I think everyone we're talking about is male. We're not talking about black women. This is black. I have one black woman. You did have one? You found one? Yes, I do. I do have one from the then, because we're going to also look at the then and the now showcase people today that are really powerful players in the industry and, and what they've been accomplishing as we would do Anyway, but this what's interesting to me is that I was able to find one black bartender from, unfortunately, one of the struggle stories. But it wasn't just totally black men that were saloon keepers or barkeeps, as anyone was called who was bartending back in the day. I guess mixologist is much more a modern term. It was a lot of (laughs) barkeeps. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, probably back from like the late 1700s and the late 1800s. But the interesting thing, so like start with a high note, there was in Washington, D.C., there was a club called the Mixologist Club which was founded in 1898 by two black men, Robert R.R. R. Bowie and J. Burke Edelin. 
And basically what they were created was, and this was from, I forget which article this was, but the qu- direct quote is a light guild of the finest black bartenders in the district, because basically they, they'd been able to create the sort of status for themselves. They were doing really well for themselves. And this was a way that they were able to all come together and sort of honor their craft. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too, is they were able to do this partially they were able to carve out the sort of segment because they were allowed to have their own restaurants, but because of segregation, it was mostly, you know, black owned, serving other black patrons. A few notable ones in the DC area were the Philadelphia House, the Academy Restaurant, Gray and Costly, and Sparta Buffet. I believe all four of those ones are still in operation. Cool. But yeah, but they mentioned like they would get really dressed up and go to these big events and they would make these really great cocktails. And there was, and then because they're in DC, some of the, some of the bigger political campaigns or, um, I don't want to say lobbying, but there was one event that they, they mentioned that was for, it was the National Colored Person Liberty League had 5,000 attendees. And that was one of the events that the Mixologist Club, they attended, but they were also providing the the libations. So, yeah, <laughs> it, it's also interesting to know. I mean, D.C. has had a history of being, you know, obviously on the forefront of anything political going through, considering it's our nation's mm-hmm. capital. But the stories that we dive into and the people that we dive into soon, there's an interesting difference between North and South where you'd almost think that the North would have been a lot more open about this. But most of the struggle stories I read came from the North and not the South. The success stories seem to come from the South. Interesting. Do you want to get into some of some of the struggle stories? Yeah, sure. So one of the ones that I wanted to talk about first, and it was a big point, a Kind of the main outline and the catalyst to this article by Wondrich, because he was talking about the influence that this had throughout Black mixology in a time that's, you know, temperance movement, also segregation. You know, there's a lot of big factors playing into this. The first one is about a gentleman named Louis Deal. And in 1892, there was a a white man named Frank Beck who opened a hotel in Cincinnati. It was called the Atlas Hotel. And he had hired a bartender and that bartender just fucking sucked. Like he was a super unreliable bartender. So Kyle's notes actually say that his bartender super sucked. Oh, sorry. I added the word fucking because, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sipping on a uncle nearest old fashioned right now. So Ooh, nice. yeah, maybe my, my language will get a little loose here with that, mm. with the cursing, but not a reliable bartender. So he had a gentleman who worked at the hotel named Louis Steele, who was a server and he was well trusted by Frank Beck. So Frank Beck put him in the position of barkeep, as they were called at the time, just any bartender barkeep. So the clientele and Beck were both white and Louis Steele was a black man. So a lot of bartenders had kind of an issue with this and they started to convince people to almost boycott this hotel and they tried to take as much clientele as they could for them, which put Frank Beck in this uncomfortable financial situation. And there was one guy named George Bear, and he was a very well-known white bartender in the city. And he essentially went to Frank Beck and gave him ultimatum saying, if you don't let go of Louis Steele, then we will continue to slander your establishment. We will post flyers about this. We will put it out to anyone who can see this. And so after a week Frank Beck came to the uncomfortable decision of letting go of Louis Steele. His bar still closed anyway. He still didn't recover. So that's karma for him. But sometimes you got to take a stand. (laughs) One of the local newspapers did have an interview with George Bear shortly afterwards. And this is where it starts to become interesting. And when you're talking about the idea of skilled labor and how barkeeps were viewed as skilled labor, and this article actually related it to skilled labor also being watchmakers or photographers. So obviously a craft that you learn and hone. And at the time, there was really no, like, there was no bartending school. There was no like set thing. It was just a craft that you learn. And any of the books that even came out at that point were like really rudimentary. So it's something that you've obviously spent hours honing and focusing on and whatever. So this George Bear guy said he wasn't racist. And it wasn't a matter of personal spite, but a matter of self-protection, because at the time, any black person was viewed as unskilled. And so if someone that's viewed by society as unskilled is performing a skilled labor position, then it makes the white 
barkeep. Oh, it's going it's to bring the position down. Down, exactly. And so, and this is at the time when they're recovering from temperance movements or like in the midst of these temperance movements, like coming into prohibition and just the security of, you know, keeping the craft, I guess. So that's where he said he had the issue, even though he wasn't racist, according he to was, him. He has decided to use racist tools and language to achieve his goal of self-preservation. Yeah, it sounds like a, yeah, I don't know, is it a gaslighting type of situation? I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know if I know what that term means. But yeah, so there was just all this pressure and they were trying to, one, protect their positions and professions. And, you know, two, they also wanted to keep their position in society as well. So that's why mm-hmm. George Bear says he created this whole movement against Lewis Deal. Just because this one black bartender was going to sully his profession. Mm-hmm. Suppose Pretty like, much. Yeah, it's tough. Well, that's the kind of the other, the perception piece. I mean, it's sort of the darker side. I mentioned that mixologist club. And part of bringing that up is that the term mixology, they had that name before it was like, you know, had a resurgence. Or it was very popular. Mm-hmm. But one of the reasons why they were so pointed at making this mixologist club as well was I guess there was such a perception of, Black people as like if they were drinking, it was like they were over drinking and they were like participating in like lawless behavior and all this stuff. So like for them, it was like they couldn't just enjoy a simple glass of whiskey. They almost had to make it into this art form and craft a really beautiful Mm -hmm. cocktail. So that was sort of the darker side of that. It's also this perception, unfortunately, that was around at the time. It really is. And then this, again, is where it plays into a lot of the the struggle stories that I have here based off some well-known individuals in the industry they are almost all in the North. And my next one is Al Strickland. He worked for Charles Shears Saloon, which was located in Indianapolis. And this is about 1891. And the newspaper, someone said he was claimed to be the only black bartender in the city. And that one is actually not the worst of the horror stories, but they said the clientele was grudging at best, but it did affect business in one sense or another grudging at best yeah there is some openness to this but it wasn't the easiest at the same time i mean it gets i mean it's downright horrible benjamin geekles who is from cudahy 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 wisconsin it's a suburb outside of milwaukee and he was hired by actually the town's ex-supervisor so someone who had a kind of like more governmental position maybe understood the town a little bit better maybe thought the city would be more open to having a black bartender or mixologist but nope nope they did not they tried to lynch him and he was able to escape the lynching but then since they couldn't lynch him the town decided to burn down the saloon very evolved yeah, yeah. This is very Neanderthalic behavior right here. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then my last one, this is, and this is, this is terrible, Kala. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. But we have to, we, we got to talk the, the good and the bad of, of right. how this, this has evolved through mixology society. This is the woman that we wanted to talk about. Her name is Hattie Carroll. And this story kills me. So she was in Baltimore at the Hotel Emerson, and this is 1963. So this is a much different time. The first people that I was talking about are more in the 1890s. This is 1963. As she was a bartender at the Baltimore's Hotel Emerson. And this guy, they actually put his name down. So fuck William Zatzinger, because that's this guy's name. So he was apparently shit-faced drunk at the bar and began striking her with a cane the article said toy cane. So I don't know what toy cane means. Is that like you have a cane to make you look like a cool person? Like, I don't really know. Yeah, what I don't, I don't toy- know, but it sounds like it was definitely big enough to do damage. So yeah, toy cane. He carried it around and he started striking her with it and also verbally abusing her as well with some really racially charged language. And as a professional, she just kept making his bourbon and ice. Unfortunately, that beating eventually caused a stroke and it eventually killed her. But the level of professionalism there is something that, you know, in modern day, any bartender is able to kick out any patron at any time. Right. You know, you can just say no all the time as a bartender for like really not a lot of reasons. <laughs> you know, you can just kind of do that. And, and in this situation, you know, I can't imagine being beat to my inevitable death and... Still being yeah. like, would you like more bourbon, sir? 
Well, part of it, it might not sadly be professional. It might just be that self-preservation. Like she may have known that as a black woman, if she got even the least bit riled up, it would just get even worse. Maybe she would have died faster. But yeah. So those are some. Yeah. And that's why I was saying like my struggle stories all come from, and I think struggle stories, I just, I say that unfortunately flippantly, but just the idea of, you know, there was a lot to overcome and we do want to celebrate the history behind this topic, but there obviously is going to be some darkness when it comes to it. Right. So we mentioned sort of what we would say, again, cute little term, a success story. We talk about success stories. We don't want to diminish the fact that there was like, you know, these are incredible success stories given the adversity. And the time, especially. Yeah. Yeah. But that is interesting. I do remember there was one course I took in college that was, I think it was, I don't remember the direct name of the course, the topic, but it was about slavery in the United States. But one of the things that kept coming up was that racism actually got much worse after slavery ended. And part Mm -hmm. of that was because if white people didn't have the ability to be like, you're worse than me because you're a slave, they had to be like, well, you're worse than me because you're black specifically. Yeah. It wasn't the idea of like owner property mentality. It was now not being able to adjust the equality of human beings. Right. So maybe in the North where things like the Emancipation Act got pushed forward earlier and there was maybe those sentiments much earlier and there wasn't quite as much of the, there was definitely slavery, but not to quite the extent. Maybe people up North had, they were just more in that zone of being like, we have to diminish you as human beings. I mean, I think we took, was it the the class that we, we took an honors college class together that, because I I can't remember the name of it either, but I remember like one of the big papers I wrote was we had to talk about the idea of like the silent hero, the way that descriptions or definitions changed. And I remember I wrote mine on Moses Fleetwood Walker, who is technically the first black African-American major league baseball player. It wasn't Jackie Robinson. It was Moses Fleetwood Walker because at the time when he was on this team, it was a major league baseball team. So I know that idea of these unsung or silent heroes that have helped pave the way and make things more open. But the focus has unfortunately, and we look at fucking America PSA for the day, like these fucking Southern states signing things about education and how they can't teach education or then the zoning rights for voting. Yeah. Like, no, re- there's our PSA for the day. <laughs> it's like yeah. PSA just like, a, we're upset. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we're just like, yeah, we're very <laughs> upset. We might be two white women, but Kara and I do want to do our best to make sure that everyone, no matter what is well-respected, but yeah. So Kara's got some cool stories But again, this is where this interesting dichotomy between the North being one way and the South being another way. I do have one Northern. So I'll start with. Yeah. So Cato Alexander. Yes. Yeah. Born into slavery in New York City. And again, I actually didn't know. I feel like a lot of history books, they say like born a slave, which makes it sound like you were just born this way. Like, yeah, no, not, I don't know how I feel. Is it like once you come out of the womb? Like that doesn't... <laughs> like it's immediate. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I chose to say born into slavery, but I just want to be... Preface that. Yeah. Yeah. But preface, like, I'm not even sure if that's the most, I don't want to say politically correct, because I'm not trying to be politically correct, but just like the most honest way of saying yeah. what the situation was. But yeah, so he was born into slavery in 1780. So this is early, early times. So he's one of the first like you know, black bartenders of great success that we have on record. But because New York State did um, have emancipation articles early, they had the States Act for the Gradual Abolition of Slavery, and that enabled him to begin working at inns and restaurants. And he did the thing that, you know, a lot of people still do today. You start as a dishwasher, and then you move your way up through the ranks. And then eventually in 1810, when he was just 30, opened his own bar and inn. It was named after himself. It was called Cato's, and it was located on 54th Street and 2nd Avenue, which is like really close to where I used to live and work in the city. So I I don't know if it's still there, but apparently he just made such a name for himself that even like a major New York newspaper published, like who has not heard of Cato Alexander in 1835. And the inn had clientele like George Washington went there. So it was definitely a well-respected establishment. So yeah, so there was a success story um, in the North, but the only one because everyone else. So John Dabney, and these ones are from the Emily Bell article in Vine Paris that I had mentioned. He was born into slavery in 1824 and he became super famous for his mint juleps. And he worked at a place called the Sweet Springs Resort in West Virginia. And apparently he actually has a variation called julep a la Dabney. 
sorry, did you have something to... Well, I was going to say one of the things I... And this is from this is a quote from the article that I read. When you said he was famous for his mint juleps in the city's newspaper, he... He was the city's, quote, cunningest compounder of beverages and the most skillful architect of pyramidal adornments and floral and fruit garniture. Oh. I mean, he had nailed this cocktail. All the levels of cocktail presentation. Nailed this cocktail. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, he really did. So he actually, it was sort of called the julep a la Dabney. People would call it when it was made by him or in his style. And he made so much money off of it that he was able to purchase his freedom and his, the freedom of his wife. So he was able to do that off of the proceeds. Yeah, when I was reading about Jad Dami, he was kind of considered this mint julep, like, prophecy, essentially. The mint julep is king. What it looks like. <laughs> yeah, the mint julep king. And I uh, read that he was only rivaled in the area by one other black bartender named Jim Cook, who apparently the Prince of Wales came out to the U.S. and <laughs> went to the establishment that Jim Cook was at and got drunk enough off of Jim Cook's mint juleps. And the Prince of Wales actually said that his drinks were the fondest memory of the city. <laughs> what did he say? So he Funny. was apparently the only other rival in the area, but he was, you know, this well-respected, but, you know, it almost seems like his thing was the mint julep. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit with some other success stories when we go on after some of the research that we've both done. But what's interesting is, you know, he's able to buy his freedom. For him yes. and his wife. And he's well-respected in the area. But when you look at that time as well, there were two top bartenders. Jerry Thomas and William Schmidt were the two top mixologists, barkeeps, bartenders, whatever the terminology is for this time period. And they were treated with, this article said, amused condescension. And so after they both died, poor, they were pretty much made fun of for that skill. But Jerry Thomas is now sort of seen as... Like a big, like, founder of modern bartending. So, why is yes, it that then now. we know Jerry Thomas is like, because I mean, we're a part, we have been a part of this. We're doing this episode to sort of, you know, in Honor Black History Month, but it's filling in a gap in our coverage because when we have done mixology episodes and research bartenders, we talked about Jerry Thomas. We didn't find John it's Dabney. True. It's true. <laughs> and it, it's true. It's, you know, just a lack of access to the information. And, you know, too, like, yes, he's, like posthumously famous, like Vincent Van Gogh was, I guess, like whatever. He's made his mark in the society. But at the time when he is like living in his, not prime, but like when he's alive years, when he's not Mm -hmm. dead, when he's alive, alive, not unalive, there was like not the level of respect there. Mm -hmm. And so that also makes me question this idea of like, why were people in Cincinnati upset about black bar keeps because it brought down their skilled labor set, as I say this in air quotes, which no one can see because it's a podcast. But, you know, why is it skilled labor there and then not skilled labor here? So why are these really like respected top one and two bartenders in the country, the ones dying? And I'm sure there's got to be like someone doing like PhD dissertations on this. But my other guess could be like, what if like the proportion of African Americans in like DC, DC they call like Chocolate City. Like it's it's a lot of so if you have a, a lot of black people, like you don't have as many white people in, especially coming f- after slavery or during slavery. There aren't a lot of white people in those sort of more labor positions. So this is like okay. a highly skilled, highest rank labor position. Okay. So maybe then there's more competition in the North where we see we have white people who have those positions, and now black people are quote unquote taking them from them. It's, but, okay. I mean, yeah, but again, it's. I'm yeah. sure somebody is doing like actual legit. And again, scholarly like work we said this. in the, the health <laughs> wine health episode for you, like we're not medical professionals, we're not like race relations professionals, sociologists, <laughs> yeah. anything. We are just doing our best to make right. sure that it's just it's it's just kind of different to, and fun to communicate new information. And this is an episode that Karen and I both learned immensely from because I mean we have been wine and right. drinking professionals for a long time, and we can tell you all the shit about Bordeaux that you want to know. But unless right. you like choose to look into something new, you don't know that the history. No, and that's the it. proof in it. Like I'm, I'm still, I'm a little bit perplexed as to why Jerry Thomas's name I definitely have heard at least twenty thousand times since we started the but, podcast, and I've never heard of John Dabney, especially since I love myself a good mint julep. Like how come you I do? <laughs> you do, yeah. Kara yeah. is a yeah. Kara is a big mint julep fan. Yeah, so I'll have to track down his recipe. One of 
uh, the next success story, Tom Bullock. Yeah, he we're actually, talking about like, you know, cocktail books here. This is a good one. Yeah. So he published the first cocktail book by an African-American in 1917 called The Ideal Bartender. And I actually found like a really neat virtual copy of it. So we'll oh, have the great. link on our show notes. And it actually like, it's really like a scan of somebody's actual book. It has some margin notes and it makes page turning noises when you click to go to the next page. Oh, we do love some you know, sensory stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It's like a virtual. Yeah. But um, and I'm actually, I made a cocktail from that book today. I was going through, I mean, these recipes, I'm like, wow, there were a few that I had all of the ingredients for. I mean, actually there were quite a few that I had, like an old fashioned I have, but mm-hmm, of course. I've had that before. His mint julep recipe is a little bit different than what I trip typically do, mostly because he makes a big point for not crushing the mint at all. And when I make a mint julep, I tend to muddle some in with my sugar and whiskey before I actually garnish with a mint. Okay. But I want to try his, but I definitely want to try the a la Dabney version as well. But I'm having the Twilight cocktail today. So that's one jigger, which a normal jigger is an ounce and a half of bourbon. I am also having Uncle Nearest in honor of our Black History Month. Yep. We love Uncle Nearest. Yep. I mean, I have it all the time anyway. But. Yeah, no, it's true. <laughs> so do I. Yeah. And then a half pony, which is a true one ounce of Italian vermouth. And I'm doing, <clears throat> I forget the name of the one I have. You going through puberty right now, Kara? I am. My voice is cracking. <laughs> <laughs> it's been doing this. And isn't it awkward, like post COVID, when you have any sort of voice that you're like, I promise I'm not sick? Like, I just, I just recovered from COVID last week. I know, again. Yeah. I, know. I had, I got round 2.0 of COVID after being boosted, vaxxed, having it before the vaccines. Kala Bischoff got COVID again. <laughs> so. It does happen. But at least my voice came back. So that was the uh, the thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My voice stays there. But anyway, I had my Italian vermouth, <laughs> which is a, a sweet vermouth. And then so you do the bourbon, the sweet vermouth, mix it with the juice of a whole lime, and then you shake it well and strain into a champagne glass and fill with seltzer. I wasn't sure how much seltzer, so mine might have been stronger. I really am going through puberty now. <laughs> yeah, you really are. You sound like Cala pre-potential tonsil <laughs> surgery. <laughs> At least it's not yeah. me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. If you need a moment to like clear some Just phlegm, I can, I can talk. Much. Yeah, I'll have, some, have some more whiskey. <laughs> yeah, um, that's but yeah, but always I really, the I really key. Like it. It's re- very refreshing. I like it a lot. I always, I never think to do whiskey with like lime juice, even though there's like a typical like whiskey sour kind of a thing, mm-hmm. but. I've been enjoying it. But yeah, so he published this book, which you can access. I mean, I want to try to find a physical copy of it, but there's a great link for it as well. But yeah, there's also some really fun ones in there called like the Horse Thief Cocktail and the Free Love Cocktail. I love Free um, Love. Yeah. I forget where I first learned of this from, but like they noted that the Free Love Cocktail in 1917 was way ahead of its time because it's not like the 1960s, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but then again, how we have sort of like some of these black bartenders being really supported by prominent white people. Intro to the book was written by George Herbert Walker, who is the grandfather of George H.W. Bush. And he was just had a lot of staunch support, especially when, I guess, Teddy Roosevelt, who was then just a, a colonel, he didn't finish one of Bullock's mint juleps because of the temperance movement. But the St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspaper wrote like a scathing editorial about how could it be possible that he didn't finish one of the mint oh, juleps. So he was like trying to appease the people, you know. Because of temperance, yeah. but Because of temperance, but, you know, how could you not finish a drink that good? Right. And like going, it's supposed to be interesting is like going through these success stories. When you just like, you know, mentioned, you know, that the grandfather of George H.W. Bush is part of the background to Tom Bullock, like... Obviously, we don't need to validate their existence by people that are powerful in the country at that time. But, you know, a lot of these success stories, they end with that from the admiration due to their white patrons. And they were some of the system's like biggest stakeholders. Right. So, I mean, you know, and as you get into like some of the other stories here, like let's talk about Uncle Dick Francis. Yeah. (laughs) I mentioned that's. Like a endearing name, but it isn't. It's a, it's, bit, it's a name that Uncle been, Dick's a little unusual now, but <laughs> yeah. But that was the. Uh, although I did find out that one of my one of the people I work with now, his name is Richard Tickle, so his nickname would be Dick Tickle. His last name is Tickle, and his parents named him Richard. Yeah, it's cruel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope I saw it on my podcast. my my list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. That's the dick joke that will make for the episode. <laughs> yeah. There we go. But yeah. 
But yeah, so Uncle Dick Francis, born into slavery in Virginia in 1827, began working at Hancock's on 12th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue in D.C., which is not far from the White House. Um, and he was so well known there that after emancipation, he was asked to bartend for the U.S. Senate. And he was really considered a classic bartender because he could really mix great drinks, but also converse and just like make people feel at ease. Like It that. was the idea yeah. of like a true bartender, you know, and this I put it in quotes under him under Uncle Dick Francis here was because the article that I was reading said, you know, some bartenders that were well-respected were, again, not my words, a julep-making robot. Because we talk about how the julep was super popular at the time, and that was what they were well-known for. But he was considered, like, the idea of the bartender that we have today. Like, you go to the bar that you go to frequently. You get to know the bartender. You talk you know, about you stuff. You marry him in my case. Well, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on that. But, um, you know, the idea of like you you go at your bartenders, your free therapist, not free because you're paying for your drinks. But like the idea of that conversation, you entice them to stay there. I did that as a bartender for years, having just like the minor amount of knowledge about a bunch of subjects just so I could connect on something with someone. And it's you're you're playing the tip game and not in your case, just the tip game. But like <laughs> I had to, <laughs> um, you know, the idea of you're living off of the tips you make. So having your regulars, knowing what their story is, you know, being conversational, that was he really kind of became that true idea of a bartender that we seek out these days when we go to our favorite places. Yeah. And this you you added this note. I didn't know quite how successful he was at earning those tips. Yeah. So I don't yeah. even really know what this means, to be honest with you, but the president pro tempore of the Senate. So I don't know what pro tempore president means, honestly. The guy, it was George F. Edmonds. And I guess they opened up a private restaurant for that institution. So I'm assuming the Senate, because that's what the article said. But he offered uncle dick francis the position of managing that and he opened it with them and then four years later he unfortunately died and so here is and the article mentioned you know here is this guy who has worked up through the ranks become the quintessential bartender you know really well respected by the people in dc who are like the top stakeholders in government positions right now and he dies four years later after he takes this job and he's illiterate but he was able to leave his family a fortune in washington real estate after all of the money he was able to make and the respect that he gained and then also was able to watch his son possess a medical degree from the university of michigan so i'm guessing probably paid for him to go through medical school too yeah so and this is like we're talking like he was born in 1827 so this is still in the 1800s. Yeah. And he was born again into slavery and was able to mm -hmm. come all the way through. So, it's yeah. a really beautiful success story there. And I'm not saying that for any other reason besides like just the time and the place where this is at is incredible. And this is where you get the respect from the people that are the stakeholders who can make all these decisions. And somehow it's not it's benefiting him personally. But how is it benefiting the majority at this point? Mm hmm. And you added one more. So I'm assuming this is from, again, the article that you were diving into, Jasper oh, Crouch. Da Jasper Crouch. Yep. So this was in Richmond, Virginia, and this is a place called the Coit Club. And it was a place that brought together like 30 of the city's leading citizens. So probably like some weird Camp David, but like on a smaller scale. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but in one of the citizens, you know, people that would come was the at the, the Chief Justice John Marshall of the U.S. Supreme Court. And this place was open May through October and every other Saturday, these top 30 leading citizens would come together and, I don't know, talk business, I don't know, drink, whatever, I don't know, you know, whatever happened in those situations that stays at the Koi Club. But so Jasper Crouch was a black freed man who presided over all of the catering and cooking there. And he was known for his and this is, again, a quote, particular and unparalleled expertise in punch making. So even to the point where his patrons and his guests were so excited by this drink that they were happy that it led them to acquiring gout and gaining weight. 
Yeah. So I, I mean, like, I know gout. gout exactly? uh, <laughs> gout is like some kind of like, uh, my dad had it when he visited me once in Denver, actually. <laughs> he got gout out here. I think it was actually a side effect of his like cholesterol medication because my uncle was yeah. on the same cholesterol medication and got gout. Oh, uh, it's a common and complex form of arthritis. It is. It's like debilitating foot pain, according to my father. Like, my father was hard. Like, my dad loves to walk like, five miles a day and like he's out in denver and he's pissed about how bad his foot hurts because of the gout and like some of the things that don't make gout better are things like salt meat alcohol Mm. (laughs) so and i'm like watching my dad eat like steak and throw a shit ton of salt on his fries and watching him like down palomas at his favorite bar i'm like well you're not doing anything for yourself here man like i don't know what to tell you to the point where i asked him if he wanted to come back to my apartment with my family to like have you know just like hang out before they went to the airport and my dad was like no i don't want to walk that far it was like five minutes from where we were at but my dad wanted to walk the 15 minutes to the bar that makes his favorite drink in denver I was like, you're not making sense. So these people are just as devoted to their punch that they kept on having, even though it was probably contributing. Good for them. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, so these guys were like, I would be a beast. Like, I'll get that. I'll have debilitating (laughs) foot pain, but I want this punch. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, that was an interesting story for me because it kind of starts to put together a lot of what we're looking at, like a lot of these bartenders were succeeding in times, the ones that we were talking about in segregation and struggle. And a lot of it was due to like the admiration from their white patrons. And again, not validating their existence due to this, but there was this very different thing about it where it was like open communities that were noticing this a lot more. And there was this sense of warmth and kind treatment. And it wasn't very common in a lot of locations at that time, as we talked about earlier. But what was fascinating was that the people that won the admiration and affection from their white clientele were like, as I said earlier, the system's like biggest stakeholders. So you're looking at government officials, senators, uh, Supreme Court justices. And when Kara was talking about Cato earlier, like his marriage write up was written in the New York Evening Post. And it was like the article described it as being like humanized, which is like something you should never have to say about right. someone's success in finding love and happiness. <laughs> you know, like, right. and then also with not, not like a thing that happened with most. Sort black, of black people at, at the, the time. time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then even like the, the, the man we were just talking about, Jasper Crouch, like he was given a proper funeral and like a beautiful burial plot and headstone. And that should be just kind of normal human stuff. But the times that we were looking at here are just like totally different. And it's unfortunate. But the people that were supporting these black mixologists that were, you know, well respected and admired and and everything, you know, it was more than just that idea of here is labor for us. It was a connection. Right. They were able to sort of establish that through their their patronage at the bar. And yeah, and so sort of like bring it full circle, I started off talking a little bit about the Mixologist Club in D.C. And today there are still some pretty cool things happening in D.C. with regard to sort of promoting the craft and sort of bring some of this history to the forefront. So just like two shout outs to in 2018, I think I want to say Capri, K-A-P-R-I, Capri Robinson of Reliable Tavern and Petworth launched Chocolate City's Best, a cocktail competition for BIPOC talent in the D.C. region. And we also have Audra Johnson, who's the managing partner of a Latin American cocktail bar called Serenata. I did see another article that listed her as working somewhere else. So apologies if one of these is wrong or maybe she's worked or is working at both. But she also co-founded uh, Black Restaurant Week down in the D.C. area. And she actually has as a part of that an R.R. Bowie cocktail competition um, that's named after the president of that mixologist club. And that's part of the restaurant week. And she did that as a, you know, to bring together bartenders of color who might not have the opportunity to compete in some of the other mainstream events or just might be overlooked otherwise. And I loved what she said about naming the competition after that mixologist club's president. She said, quote, here, I'm getting, do you want to say it, Calla? I'm getting my cube again. <laughs> Well, like Kara would like to say is the idea was to build the confidence for younger or newer bartenders, but also pay homage to the fact that we're not new to this. She says, we've been here. And I think that's a great way to look at, you know, what Kara and I set out on this episode is that there's places that are uncomfortable to speak about sometimes, but it is a big part of alcohol and alcohol hasn't always been pretty and shiny. There's right. like we might really enjoy it and the thing it gives to us. But, you know, 
it, it wasn't that way for a long time. And so there is a privilege of being able to live in this society and being able to, in, in you know, areas, nothing's still perfect, but the idea of, it, it, it's totally different. Um, looking back at bartending and when black bar keeps or black business owners back in the day were able to have their own establishments. A lot of them were saloons. And I have always thought of saloons as the idea of like the Western world. Like you get the guy with the cowboy hat with the swinging doors coming in. But the idea of a saloon was much different back in the day. And black bartenders, you know, had a good stronghold in certain black demographic areas to, you know, advance their career and their life. But when you look at what the idea of a saloon was back in the day, and this is another quote, saloons tended to be, quote, populated by a raffish crowd of dissipated clerks, ward healers, police court lawyers, avant la lettre trustafarians, newspaper men, handshakers, drink cagers, gamblers, pimps, confidence men, stock jobbers, and such like avoided by the conscientious and the respectable. So... Not only was this obviously a skilled profession from the get-go because you are learning something without the background like we have today, but you are put into an environment that is physically, mentally, and emotionally exhausting on you. And that history is good to be discussed, especially ending with her quote, we've been here. That's great. Right. Yeah. And I think if we don't discuss it too, we don't hear about, I mean, we want to know the names of the people who, you know, struggled and, and had who ultimately died, but also to know about the names of the people who, like this cocktail book that you can now read, because we'll have the link to it. There's some neat stuff in there and a lot of stuff that we, we drink today, but don't necessarily think about who first published the recipes perhaps. So there's always room for improvement and there's always room to educate yourself. Another PSA for the day. Yeah. And we're trying. So uh, we're doing our best. You- yeah, thanks for making it to the end with us, those of you who are here. And, it's a little um, bit of a longer one for us, but, you know, you don't want to skimp on good information. So, yeah. And we'll see you next week with we don't know what. So Yeah, we have you. no idea. <laughs> All right. Double fish Cheers. yourselves. <laughs> Bye.